So I'm very sorry you all have to partake in the uh, experience of listening to me read a speech. Uh, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. So good morning. I do want to thank Doug Comstock for inviting me to say a few words this morning. Um, I apologize. I can't really stay longer. Um, I'm not actually one to pop into a ceremony and, and offer up a bunch of congratulatory platitudes and hand out a big check. I think that's Ed McMahon at, at Publishers Clearinghouse that does that. Uh, but it's just not me. If, if I had any style, and most people know that I don't, uh, that wouldn't be the one I would, would pick. Um, but I would like to take this opportunity to speak out um, once again about something of interest to me and to many of you assembled here. And that's the role of, of prizes. Uh, such as uh, NASA's Centennial Challenges in spurring innovation through competition. And I also want to talk about how and why NASA not only should but, but really must pursue and nurture appropriate partnerships with the emerging commercial space sector when it is reasonably within the grasp of, of such firms to meet our needs. I believe that these issues are important and I've been consistent in my emphasis upon them throughout my tenure as administrator. Now, prizes in general, and, and NASA's centennial challenges in particular, are a high leverage tool to stimulate innovation. We do have to realize that prizes are simply one tool in the toolbox of, of various procurement instruments available to the government. It's a case that one size definitely does not fit all. We must be judicious in thinking through the risks and rewards, costs and benefits of prize competitions versus other procurement vehicles such as research grants, cost plus award fee contracts or firm fixed price contracts or space act agreements all of which are other tools that the agency has in its toolbox uh, and so while i am an advocate for the use of prize authority we've had at nasa since 2005 something for which i especially want to thank our congressional authorization committees uh, i want us to be realistic about their utility uh, for example, I think it would be fruitless for the American taxpayer to sponsor multi-billion dollar prizes for manned missions back to the moon or to Mars, as some uh, prominent uh, members of the chattering class have suggested. Um, the high upfront cost and technical complexity of such missions, to me, renders them unrealistic uh, for a private concern to undertake at this time. It's an interesting thought experiment but it's not an idea which would gain much traction in the real world, in my opinion. So if it continues to be the policy of the United States government to establish a human presence on the moon or carry out a voyage to Mars, and I hope it does, then we need to commit proactively to doing it. We should not establish a prize for the accomplishment and then sit back and wait to see whether or not it is claimed. We should either care enough to make it happen or not bother. Now, in the case of the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge, I want to congratulate Doug and the X Prize Foundation and many others here in formulating and organizing a thoughtful prize competition at just the right price point and level of technical difficulty for the competing teams. I've been told that 12 teams who competed for this challenge spent nearly 70,000 man hours and the equivalent of about $12 million trying to meet this challenge before them, all to win the $2 million prize. So this investment offers a six to one leverage of taxpayer dollars against the total two million in prize money available and more than 30 to one against the $350,000 that Armadillo has won to date. And there's still 1.6 million on the table as Doug mentioned if uh, one of the 12 teams is successful next year. And prize competitions are most useful when government agencies like NASA or DARPA are actively seeking individuals and companies who would not normally participate in a traditional government procurement process, the, the citizen inventor, Doug called them. Prizes entice the kind of people who are repelled by the cumbersome nature of government processes. We're looking for the Wright brothers who are tinkering away in the garage of their bicycle shop or the patent clerk whiling away the hours contemplating the deeper meaning of space and time. We're looking for people like Charles Lindbergh and the consortium that backed him in his pursuit of the Orteg Prize for the first nonstop flight from New York to Paris. We're looking for people like Peter Homer, who used his experience in sewing sailboats, or sewing boat sails, and who commandeered his family dining room and garage to build a better glove for our astronauts 
and win a $200,000 prize from NASA. The competitors in a prize competition must be willing to take on the risk of obtaining upfront financing for their development costs to meet the challenge. For this reason, we salute those who risk their money and time on the chance of winning such a reward. So when government agencies like NASA formulate a prize competition, we must try to put ourselves in the shoes of the competitors. We must consider how they might recoup their investment beyond the prize money itself. For example, Burt Rutan's scaled composites team is building a commercial suborbital vehicle to follow on to their highly successful Spaceship One. And Peter Homer is now applying the design of his new glove to a next generation spacesuit. The prize competition itself was only a start. Now, those of us on the government side of the space business must recognize a fundamental truth. If our experiment in expanding human presence beyond the Earth is to be sustainable in the long run, it must ultimately yield profitable results, or there must be a profit to be made by supplying the needs of those who explore to fulfill other objectives. Think about the California Gold Rush and Levi Strauss. And in the long run, think about whether it was the prospectors or Levi's that did better. Space exploration today is primarily a government activity, but that will not always be so. In fact, it's our job to work to make it that way. We should reach out to those individuals and companies who share our interest in space exploration and are willing to take risks to spur its development. In that vein, I especially want to thank the sponsors of the Google Lunar X Prize for their formulation of a difficult but eminently worthy prize competition for robotic landing on and, and roving on the moon. Commercial interests might have different motivations than the government for wishing to explore space, but we can respect those differences while capitalizing on our common interests. For example, while NASA is not in the business of space tourism, we should encourage those who are. A successful space tourism industry would offer many synergistic opportunities for private-public partnerships. As a matter of national policy to promote the growth of space enterprise generally, we should encourage such partnerships. Government agencies can and should turn to the private sector to meet their needs for goods and services that are not core governmental functions. And that's a definition that can change with time. We've seen that transition in information technology. We will see it again in other fields in the years to come, including microgravity parabolic flight services. Be still your heart, Peter. Suborbital launches and cargo resupply to and from the International Space Station. As many of you know, we hope to award our ISS Commercial Resupply Services contract later this month, just prior to Christmas. We hope that it will evolve, or we hope that it will help to evolve our nation's low Earth orbit transportation industry to one that is more cost effective and as reliable as what we have today. When we retire the three space shuttle orbiters from service, we will need other means to meet ISS logistics requirements. And while we must do whatever is necessary to sustain and capitalize upon our investment in ISS, I would much rather be spending taxpayer funds on U.S. commercial providers than otherwise. NASA's COTS partners, commercial uh, orbital space uh, transportation systems providers, are providing, are making great strides. In late September, SpaceX's Falcon 1 rocket flew successfully, and on November 22nd, SpaceX conducted their first full duration test firing of all nine Falcon 9 rocket engines. Um, Orbital Sciences recently completed their preliminary design reviews for the cargo modules and, and designs for their launch facilities at Wallops Island, and the design of their Taurus 2 launch vehicle is underway. I've been asked on many occasions for my opinion on commercial crew transportation to ISS. Uh, we've made, NASA has made an initial $500 million bet on commercial cargo service to the ISS, and this is actually our more critical need. Uh, we cannot, we have a, a method, uh, we can buy rides from Russians. We have, but at least we have a method of getting crew to space station. We don't currently have a method of getting cargo to space station and we can't support crew without cargo. So this is actually the more critical need, and while I, I certainly wish that I had more money to invest in developing COTS crew capability, along with many other things that I wish I had more money for, uh, I think it's unwise to raid other accounts to increase our bet on COTS crew capability. For those who claim that NASA's uh, systems, the Orion crew vehicle and Ares-1 launcher, 
will compete with commercial providers. I have to again remind everyone here that in our plan, commercial systems are primary for ISS logistics. That's our primary path. It's in our budget. Orion and Ares are the backstop if U.S. commercial providers are not successful in developing their own capability. Orion and Ares are sized for missions beyond low Earth orbit, and they will not and cannot be as cost effective as commercial systems built specifically for ISS transportation. We should not yield to the temptation to build yet another government system solely for access to LEO. As a matter of fiscal responsibility, we should not design systems like Orion and Ares for low Earth orbit operations, only to redesign them later for missions to the Moon, the near Earth asteroids, and Mars. And as a matter of strategic policy, the Earth to LEO market niche should be left to commercial providers if they can fill it, and to government systems only if they cannot. I spoke earlier of potential synergies between the nascent space tourism industry and government missions. I want to reiterate what I've said in previous speeches. When the capability becomes available, we will purchase seats for various science payloads, microgravity experiments, and perhaps even astronaut training. NASA should be a customer for these suborbital flight services because, and because each suborbital mission will have applications across various mission directorates, our Space Ops Mission Directorate has been assigned the overall task of managing that effort, just as it does in procuring launch services today for our various satellite missions. There's been considerable discussion within NASA about how we might use these emerging capabilities, how we might adapt our existing unmanned suborbital program uh, to enhance these experiments through human interaction, as well as to how much funding we should plan for and when those funds will be needed once suborbital capabilities are, are successfully demonstrated. Now, we're not interested in doing junk science just to fly it, uh, and we're not interested in subsidizing uh, the suborbital space tourism uh, development as we are uh, in the same fashion that we're doing with COTS. That's not a NASA charter. But we do plan to leverage this new capability when it emerges to improve the science that we can conduct uh, as we do today on sounding rocket missions or to lower our costs. You should see more about this initiative in next year's budget request. Let me turn now to uh, uh, parabolic uh, flight services. Parabolic variable gravity aircraft flight services represent uh, another real opportunity for us to turn to the commercial sector to meet our requirements. We've conducted several flight tests with Zero-G Corporation uh, to determine whether their offering can meet uh, our requirements for microgravity experiments that we currently perform on, on government C-9 aircraft. These test flights uh, have included already five experiments from small businesses which are developing technology under the auspices of NASA's SBIR program. Tests aren't yet complete, but project managers are confident that Zero-G can meet our needs. Thus, we're planning for the transition of all microgravity flight activities from the NASA C-9 to commercial aircraft. Uh, the C-9 will continue to support space shuttle operations uh, and will act as a backstop for commercial microgravity service, but our primary path will be commercial. Companies large and small are finding ways to support NASA's exploration needs. Uh, I'll again turn to Armadillo Aerospace, today's winner of the $350,000 Lunar Lander Challenge. They are also working on a LOX methane rocket engine to be tested in an altitude chamber at White Sands. Jen Allred, the project manager in the propulsion test office out at White Sands, describes this partnership, quoting, as a great demonstration of how two organizations who generally function in very different manners are able to approach a common goal to get to the moon. Both NASA and Armadillo know their businesses very well and are eager to share their technical knowledge and resources to achieve mutual success. This is exactly the type of relationship that we want to establish and ought to want to establish with the emerging commercial space community. We need to maintain this perspective as we consider the larger context of the proper role of government in spurring innovation and leveraging commercial capabilities. Development of space simply cannot be all government all the time if we want to have a truly space-faring civilization. Everything we've learned from history tells us that this is so and we must plan our future with these lessons firmly in mind. So let me return to our gathering today. We're here to recognize the accomplishments of a team, Armadillo Aerospace, in winning the first $350,000 
the level one prize for the Lunar Lander Challenge. It's the biggest award yet for our Centennial Challenges program. Thomas Edison once said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Today, we're here to recognize the genius and the perspiration of Armadillo Aerospace. Thanks.